Hi, my name is Tim Walker. I'm here from Seagate. My partner, James Borden. I work in uh, Seagate, Seagate Research and Managed Storage Concepts. James is part of our um, product line management division. He's, uh, he's not one of the um, sales type guys. He's a direct technical support on the field PLM guy. And together we're here to talk a little bit about uh, parallelism on hard drives and specifically what Seagate's been doing to, in the dual actuator and other ways to increase parallelism on hard drives um, to increase the value, lower the TCO, and, and uh, show you that they are, they are pertinent and, and critical for high performance storage architectures. Even today in the land and, and era of silicon and HDDs. So, I kind of wanted to tell you why we're even going down this path of multi-actuator. Multi-actuator hard drives, the idea's been around for a long time. Various ways of, being, of going parallel on rotating media has been around for a long time. Uh, er, companies have produced them uh, over the last few decades. No one for a while. Uh, Seagate floated the idea internally a couple of years ago. And most of us thought, oh no, here we go again. But really there is a, there's an actual reason for doing it this time. And this chart, this chart is a, um, it's a Seagate chart um, with some Seagate projections. And don't hold me to these. I'm not uh, giving you a, a product roadmap or anything like that. But they're, I mean, they're, they're accurate. Just, I'm not going to swear, you know, you can't order this stuff. Um, but what it shows is that as the hard drive capacity continue to increase, and we're continuing to increase our aero density discount, our density in general, disk density, our capacity is continuing to go up. Um, but the method that we use to pull the data off the drive, and mostly I talk about pulling the data off the drive, because in, in, in most of the modern systems that you guys are, are accustomed to, the customer rights coming in, um, we have a lot more latitude on caching them and, and, and spooling them out. Whereas the, um, the SLAs that we're really mostly concerned about are reads, where you can't effectively cache enough to guarantee that anything you want to pull off a hard drive is going to be ready that quickly. So what, what you want to show is that as, as hard drive capacity keeps going up, the basic fundamental way of getting the data off the drive, which is spinning a platter and moving the head, everybody knows about, is not getting any faster, uh, especially at the, at the cost targets we're trying to maintain for rotating storage. There's not a lot of money for, um, for going out and, and losing aerial density for higher RPM or spending you know, a lot more money on higher speed actuators. And, and as you know, the energy to move an actuator faster goes up much faster than the actual speed. It's really not a, a good curve to be on. So and the end result is arms, heads still move at about the same speed. You keep increasing the capacity. So your IOPS per terabyte, which is kind of the measurement we're using, and we're really talking about you know, just a 4K random IOPS is trending down, no question. And it can't go down forever. There's a bare minimum that, that our customers are asking for. And for, um, for large scale cloud type systems, our customers are asking us to stay in this range right here, about five to 10 IOPS per terabyte. Over 10 is great, but you know, hard drives really aren't being called on uh, to service directly to the customer. So there's not a huge amount of gain being up here. That's wasted, that's wasted uh, capability. Uh, but once you start dropping below seven to five here, then it just takes too long to even to backfill or to service a read that you don't have cached. So I mean, this chart just kind of like shows what the, what the what the outlook looks like for hard drives and their performance characteristics. Certainly plenty of capacity, you know, 40 terabytes out here. And that's 2023 is not that far away. 
that's a lot of capacity, but you're talking, you know, maybe two IOPS per terabyte to get to it. So a lot of, lot of capacity behind a single, single threaded actuator, single threaded head. James, you know, you could. Uh, oh, I can do that. You could do that, yes. Are you qualified? I don't know. <laughs> Are you ready to go? Ready, yeah. And here's one of our customers that we've been working closely with on, on solving this problem. And this kind of shows what their viewpoint is. This blue line is the, the 10 to 7 IOPS per terabyte number that I was talking about, is what, what that customer believes that when he applies his caching, his data management up, up in the stack, the flash tier layers, when everything is, when the dust settles, he's saying that right up until, you know, at this point, and in, in, in with some improvements as he um, has uh, improved the efficiency of his caching and his tiering, he's still looking at 2018 at about seven IOPS per terabyte. And uh, our, as our drive capacity is going up, our IOPS per terabyte is going down, as we saw before, and we're just kissing it right here, so we're keeping him pretty happy here but we're all looking ahead to next year when we're no longer gonna be able to meet his requirements. And so, this is for one of his applications. Uh, he has other applications that have, that this line moves up and down. And so what the things are, what they're having to do is they're either having to buy more flash, which is super expensive. Um, they're doing things like destroking the drive. And so when, uh, when he purchases a 14 terabyte drive, you can really only effectively use the 10 terabytes at the OD. Um, we have customers who are exploring uh, somewhat fragile schemes, I think, of keeping hot data at the OD and using the ID of the drive to store the data they know is cold, that they can afford to uh, have a slower access time to, but that's not ideal either because your hot data at the OD, if you have your cold data at the ID, when you do eventually need that, you're still single threaded. You, you pull the head off your hot data. Well, that doesn't make any sense. And so um, there really isn't a good general purpose solution for this problem here. Same customer's analysis as we gave him some uh, performance predictions on increasing parallelism on hard drives, and which is this kind of crazy looking graph here, which shows the effect of the, the various ways we have of adding parallelism to drives. Multiple actuators is the, is the most popular one and the, and the one we talk about a lot currently, but there are other methods of multiple readers, uh, for example, that combine with multiple actuators to increase random and sequential performance in a, in a balanced way. But you can see we have made some, we got some IOPS per terabyte predictions over here um, that again, that we show that do provide him actually some margin uh, in his IOPS per terabytes requirement going out through you know, another six years or so. And so this is kind of what, what drives even this whole reason why we've taken a change in the, in the hard drive design path. Does this make sense? Because, because we have our ideas and we have a couple of key customers who are interested in this, but you know, and I, and I came here to, to, to show you our ideas and, and to, you know, maybe, so when you left here, you wouldn't think we were crazy. But I also came here to get your feedback if possible. So if you have, you know, some insight on this and why you, you think this is crazy or why it makes sense, I'd be definitely interested to hear this. Okay, next slide, James. Yeah. 
I didn't come here to sell you Seagate drives, I promise. Um, but this is a Seagate picture. This is a Seagate marketing picture right here. And, um, and these are Seagate green lines here that, to show people who, you know, data and stuff like that. But it's okay because this picture is actually worthwhile to, to show you how, uh, how we are approaching our first generation for increasing parallelism on drives. You know, this is a pretty good picture and show how it's done. And it's, it is really, on, on, on the mechanical side, not too radical. We took the, your, the actuator you're used to seeing on the pivot and we split it in half. And so the top and bottom half move independently. We've got two VCMs, two voice comb motors, two sets of magnets, got two motor drivers on the, on the electronics, and they operate independently. With the, the innovation for, for us, and this is stuff that we know how to do. It's one of the things that make this kind of solution good for a company like Seagate. When it comes to putting lots of mechanical pieces in a small part, making them work together smoothly, that's something we've been doing for 40 years last month. And so this, this is something that we have a lot of strength in. And once we understood that this is a way to answer these problems, it has been, um, we have the people, and we have the ability to execute this pretty cleanly, and we have. The, um, particularly on the servo side, we have, uh, we've got some servo feed forward algorithms on this implemented so that while this bottom actuator is track following and reading and writing your data, top actuator can seek and continue to read and write lower and vice versa. Seek simultaneously, they can settle simultaneously. Um, the servos talk to each other so they know what they're doing, what each other's doing. Um, in, our, in this case, in this first generation parallel architecture, you can see the heads are in, you know, it's, we divide the heads in half, so there's no shared media across these two actuators. No shared LBAs. Yes? Uh, you, you want to do that? Like, yeah. Sure. sure. They are independent, yes. Mm -hmm. not, not a hard no, it's the reason why it's necessary is because at the TPI, at, at, at tracks per inch, these things operate at about 800,000 tracks per inch. Um, uh, any motion, any, any, any motion or vibration introduced into the base deck or into the pivot, it, you know, may, from here, definitely impacts here. I mean, you can imagine at that kind of, at that kind of level of precision. And when you, and these things still do have full performance seeks. So when this guy in the top, when we hit this VCM to, to move him around at full speed, then you have, of course, this uh, magnetic leakage. So you do have some impact on the lower VCM. And you have the, the base deck moves slightly, you know, in, because of, you know, action and reaction, which causes, uh, a coupling down here, um, and you get plain old just vibration in the bearing, and and that normally you would be undetectable, but at these levels of mechanical precision, do matter. And uh, you have a power supply rail dip. You know when you smack this guy with drive current, then your track following current that you're using here to hold him on track. Um, his power supply, his input voltage, you know, sees a divot. Um, and there's, and I'm not a servo engineer, so there's uh, more there than even I can, I probably already told you, might have told you more than I really know already, but yes? So I have a question. Um, so, for this, uh, Tom so, assuming that uh, you're sharing data between, you know, you're writing data uh, between two heads, right? Mm -hmm. Be 
That was, that's how we started with this project. Um, on, on the very first one was a bunch of servo simulations. And really, the, the team that did it that in, um, in Minneapolis, who were responsible for the, the generation design, had to took a road show around the company to try and convince the rest of us that this was even possible. And they did um, a lot of early track following uh, simulations. And then, then we, saw real, we saw real data where we record the, the position error signal, which is you know, the routine for a company, routine for us, record the position error on this head here, and then you know, seek the crap out of this one up here and watch this and prove that it doesn't move, that, that no matter what happens, we don't exceed our off-track limits for write or read, which are different. Um, and then the same thing on, on, on seeks, on coordinating seeks. Uh, seek, what we call a seek settle, and hard drive people or know what that is, is, is a seek has three parts. You whack it with a bunch of current to get it moving. It moves across at a, at a particular velocity, depending on the seek length. And then you have to decelerate the head and have it land on track. And it, set, and it kind of comes in on track. And you know, then the loop, the, the track positioning loop takes over and it settles in on, on the center of the track. That's the most uh, difficult part of the seek. It's the part where you're most susceptible to outside vibration. And it's also extremely important for performance because when we do rotational positional sort, which is one of the ways that hard drives increase their performance, they prefer to, um, to come in on track right before the sector is coming up that they need to write. I'm doing all the hand motions here, I hope you can follow. Um, and so if your seek settle is crappy, if it's poor, and it doesn't settle, then the, your sector passes below the head while you're still trying to uh, obtain track center. And then you have to wait 10 milliseconds for it to come around again, which you know, it's, uh, no one wants to wait. But, you know, but Tom, over at Pragmatically, as we've been developing these, we've been testing them in production customer systems and racks to make sure that in a real production environment, we're not getting a lot of vibration attenuation between lungs and across drives. And that's been part of the, the, the design process is to make sure that we're able to do that. Mm -hmm. One very basic question. The, before, there was only one of these. And now you're creating two of these, non sharing LDAs, but you're adding two servos, two of everything, right? Right. That increases the cost. Yes. Okay. Does increase the cost. So does this apply to PMR and SMR? <clears throat> yep. In, in different it, 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 the, recording, the recording technology down here is orthogonal to this solution. So um, our, in our particular roadmap, Seagate's roadmap, um, we have, both, recording, we have all, both those recording technologies planned for, for this architecture. Does it present itself as a single lung? This presents itself as two lungs. And the requirements that you mentioned before, the cloud type requirements are the same for SMR as well as PMR, right? They are generally the same for, and, and, and actually the, the detailed requirements I showed you uh, with the two charts, those are SMR requirements specifically. So, so with, the, with this diagram, I immediately, we all kind of focus on there's two arms here. But then I realized as I looked at this chart deeper, the bigger issue is you're reading and writing in parallel, multiple heads simultaneously. Yes. Today, it's been a while since I've been in the drive business, but I'll, I'll always used to be one head at a time. That's right. It's still one head at a time, isn't it? It is one head at a time per actuator. Yeah, yeah. Today, it's one head at a time. You, you don't do any parallel reads and writes. In, in, in this... Um, in the, production drive. in the production drives, you're right. It's right. one head at a time. Okay, so this is going from 1x to 4x, plus you're splitting the actuator, so you could be different uh, radius simultaneously. This goes from 1x to, to 2x because, because this is a two-channel. Okay. It, it, it scales to nx, but depending on how many f actuators you want to put around. That diagram looks like you're, you're reading those green things that, on the platters. 
leads me to believe that you're writing multiple heads in parallel or reading multiple heads in parallel. Yeah, I'm marketing people. I told you this is a marketing diagram. <laughs> I just stole it because it, it looked good, you know. Okay, I got it. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of your question. How is the failure of our reliability of these drive changes when you're putting multiple channels? The, okay, so if you, you have two, one, for one thing is you don't gain any redundancy with this. There, there's, there are far more single points of failure than there are independent. I mean, there are two read channels, so conceivably you could lose one read channel and keep the other. Um, there are two uh, sets of servo uh, electronics, so you could lose one, lose the other. Those are not the areas of the drive that fail anyway. So um, we do not present this as offering any improvement in, like you would not put two copies of your data on here and hope that you had a better chance of recovering it. Um, what I've been telling people, and, and my job at Seagate is, in, in Seagate Research Event Concept, is, is I work with our key customers implementing our new technology like this, like SMR, into their systems. What I tell them is th there is a slight difference in reliability because um, there are some failure points that are limited to one LUN. But if your reliability, if your availability calculation is is down to where you think you might be able to tell a difference, I, I think you're fooling yourself. And so there's no, so we're definitely not pushing this as a improvement in availability. Now, on any, as you know, if you do um, failure analysis, uh, if you do, not failure analysis, but um, a reliability analysis on parts, every part you add decreases from the total system reliability, that's a fact. And so this drive has more parts than another drive. So by that analysis, by a strict, um, a strict reliability analysis it is less reliable in, in, incrementally. Um, our rely numbers from our testing, you know, don't, it's the change is undetectable in real world testing. The failure modes that you're most accustomed with on a, on a hard drive, which is head failures, um, Head crashes, you're really not allowed to say head crashes anymore. Um, those reliability remains the same. You have the same number of heads and same number of platters. Contamination failures, the kind of failures that you're used to seeing on a drive and firmware bugs, um, we have, it's, it's the same. We have the same, in other words, this, the firmware that runs on this the firmware, your possibility of getting a firmware bug is about the same, practically zero. Um, and uh, <laughs> head crashes are the same. So um, our, for, for pragmatic real life deployments, this is as reliable as a, as a high cap drive is currently today from Seagate. Two LUNs, uh, software has to change to be able to take advantage of five to ten IOPS per terabyte now. Because I, on a single LUN, it's still going down. Yes. So I have to kind of parallelize my software. You now. do. And the LBAs are non overlapping. Right. So it's complete. I mean, the, the customer you're talking about, do they change software significantly? I mean, just to get a sense of how much software overhead, uh, sorry. You can, yeah, this, so you can drop this, so it's a, it's a, I have a slide that kind of shows what the, what the, what the drive architecture looks like that I can go to. Um, I can wait. Yeah, if, unless, if there's, someone wants to kind of talk about if, if we're done with this. <laughs> yeah, no, but. One more question back there. Yeah. You can drive things along, it's, you're yeah. the speakers. Yeah. If you covered this already, uh, why was the decision made to co-locate these two actuators instead of putting them you know, on opposite sides? Of the 
Okay, that, that's a good question, and, and this is first generation. The nice thing about this design is this, this can be manufactured in our current, pro, you know, this, the base deck is the same as a regular base deck. This required a couple of minor changes to assembly equipment, um, but really um, it, it is very, you know, it's so similar to a standard op that it really goes down our automated lines very simply. Um, it, it's sim uh, conceptually it was simpler for our, as a first generation for our customers. Uh, because since we just flat out just split the LBA space, we have more, I mean, there are more options and, and we have more ideas and... But we, the, the, the opposing takes up more real estate, which is going to probably affect the yes. diameter, which is going to affect capacity. That's one of the biggest disadvantages to go into multiple uh, pivots uh, is that it reduces the amount of space for disks. And, this, and the, the sad truth is, is this is your most valuable disk real estate is at the OD. Um, and so every millimeter that you can add out here makes a big difference. So taking a few millimeters out to make room for more pivots um, hurts your capacity uh, disproportionately to um, you know, if you you go you go down by you know one percent, but you lose more than one percent of capacity. So, for all those reasons and and more, I, I'm, I'm sure um, this looked like a good starting point. Um, as capacity goes up, as we bring in the energy-assisted magnetic stuff, you know, the mammers and hammers and such. Um, if there's an, we, th we think there's probably going to be a need for more actuators, especially for some applications. In those cases, then they will do have to trade off between um, disk diameter, cost, um, tooling uh, in the factory, that kind of stuff. But in this case, this required, uh, this, minimum, this was as least disruptive as possible to everybody. Um, we're, we're still in form factor. Uh, in fact, if you look at the drive, you can't tell, you, from the outside, it looks the same. Naturally, I don't have one with me, um, but you can't even tell by looking at it that it's dual actuator. Yeah, well, there, was, there was a question on the impact on the stack. Impact stack, yes. Let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about that. Um, because here's what it looks like. Um, this is not a marketing diagram, as you can tell. Uh, in our case, and there's no requirement for this, but um, again, as a first generation design, um, we went with a single port SAS for our implementation. We went, we went with SAS because of lungs. Uh, we discussed, we, we went through the, the SATA and the various ways to take these two actuators and present them because our, the customer we worked with the most on bringing this out was interested in having control over which actuator he was talking to. We know we could, we could hide this and do a, in, you know, internally divvy up the storage between the actuators. Um, our customer, our early customers for early development had requested that they could talk, that they could access the actuators independently, and so um, SATA doesn't have any built-in uh, subordinate storage ability. There's no LUNs or namespaces or anything in SATA, and um, and our customer wasn't comfortable with taking the SATA namespace and just dividing it in half. He was comfortable. He was comfortable with SAS and LUNs. So that's the and. So were we, and we are perfectly comfortable with LUNs. So that what drove the decision for the for at this stage of, of the technology rollout. We're in multiple LUNs with two LUNs um, on a single port SAS. We have a common, you know, drives have cache. We have a common cache. 
Uh, but the two, the two read-write subsystems can pull from the cache independently. So they can implement their own uh, sorting for a rotational sort and for um, uh, seek sorting. The, uh, what I call the HDD system, you know, the, the management of the drive is common. So either, either LUN, according, and that's just per the spec, the, unlike NVMe, uh, SAS does not have a concept of an admin, or a, a, a well-developed concept of an admin port or admin function at the device level. And so um, your admin commands are available on either LUN. This is an implementation. Uh, this is what's, when, when you talk about drop in and how much stack changes you need to do, this is one of the areas where you, where you have to pay attention. Um, you t it's possible that, to issue a command on LUN zero that affects LUN one. Uh, every favorite command is a spin up, spin down. You can, if you spin down LUN zero, LUN one will spin down underneath you, that kind of stuff. So that's our, that was our initial level of firmware sophistication where we honestly were concentrating more on the data path side of it. And we have got feedback from customers that said in some cases that's not a good idea. For example, sanitize. Um, we want to make sure that when, you, that when you sanitize, you know exactly what you're sanitizing. So we have work in the committee, the, um, T10, and work with our customers on, on these commands, what is the best way to approach this in SAS. Otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. You have two LUNs. When you put this thing in your system, it just shows up as two drives. And, if, and you just use them like two drives. There are some workloads since we have a common cache, there's, we, have, we, have, we have an algorithm that makes sure this cache gets used evenly and these commands are pulling commands and data in and out of the cache fairly. There are some workloads, I'll tell you, there are some workloads, some diabolical workloads that can cause one of these to starve. And this is part of what we're learning as we, as we get this into customers is what the, real, what the workloads look like and how to keep that from happening. Yes, sir? On FISHU of flush, does it flush both lungs? Pardon? If I issue a flush, command does it flush a same flush? Currently, it flushes both lungs. That was a firmware decision based on implementation uh, on, on a on a reliable implementation based on our current SAS architecture. There's nothing in this design that requires that to happen. Head of Q, for example, is good for um, only one LUN. Head of Q goes to the head of that LUN only. Yes, sir. Array controllers have had multiple LUNs for decades. So software is aware, is aware of multiple LUNs being behind the same physical port. So it's not to that software, it's not as radical as, as some people think, but it is something that you do still need to be thoughtful of because there can be interactions or there, it's, it's optional whether they're interactions or not, like flush, like start-stop unit. There's ways to do it so that they don't interact. Sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't. So it's, well, it's interesting and you need to be thoughtful of it, Host software has dealt with multiple months behind a single port before. It's not brand new. Then that's our position too. And in, in some cases we're answering, you know, we have, in some cases we have customers who had never seen that, you know, and they're asking hard questions. In some cases our own rely and, and suitability for use people who are, who are, you know, like, you know, storage lawyers, right? They want to make sure, are you sure you're covered? if your customer does something that you don't expect it to do. And this area and how to deal with it is evolving, honestly. I think you should trademark that phrase, storage lawyers. Storage lawyers. <laughs>
James, you can be the first one. Yeah. Okay. Next. Yeah. The, the other approach on this, and this is further out, the, what I showed you before is we're, we're building that today um, in, in uh, what would you call it, James, demonstration quantities, um, early models, proto not, that's not prototypes, but uh, proof yeah. of concept, samples, sample quantities, yes, thank you. Um, the PCIe and VME approach to this is a little cleaner in my mind um, because NVMe does have a clean subordinate storage model with, with uh, namespaces um, and endurance groups that does allow you to cleanly separate the functionality between uh, management and data. Um, so this is a block diagram of a, this is a proposed block diagram out of our NVMe PCIe hard drive internal specification um, for a multiple actuator. In this case, where parallelism is implemented in multiple actuators, our plan is one namespace per actuator. Um, in our case here, our, our, our PCIe NVMe hard drive customers have specifically asked us to support dual port. Um, so there's no reason why we can't support dual port on the SAS. Uh, it was done as a, uh, again, a, as firmware, low risk firmware uh, implementation. Our, our initial customers weren't asking for it and so that was, is a feature we'd implement later. Next. Uh, Yes. If you are uh, provisioning, creating, deleting namespaces during manufacturing, are you also considering the same for SATA in future? That I can't answer. I, I mean, I'm not. So, I don't know. Is the is the word? I, I I'm not. I'm not forbidden to answer it. It's just. Wise, it is. I'm assuming it's in the same realm. Yes. It, I mean, the. Uh, Underlying drive features that enable that to happen are available, you know, across the platforms. But um, I'm not, I don't really know the answer to that question. No one's talked to me about it, I'll tell you that. Yes? No, no impact. Three and a half. These are all, I mean, the dual act the, the parallel dual actuator drives are targeted at um, at three and a half inch high capacity, you know, um, customers. It, it, me, I, I am a cloud customer. I mean, my work is all with our, our cloud customers. So that's what I focus on. The uh, I know it's also um, it, the the part the the others of me who are working on on you know more transactional type loads are also interested in in the dual actuators because of the increased random performance. Uh, that is not my area of expertise. Namespaces are shared across the controllers, yes, for the dual port version. You have to wait a couple of years for you get this, but it is coming, and it uh, it it offers um, some exciting possibilities for hard drives participating in uh, in a modern stack. So the the NVMe spec allows that and does not require that. You could design it so that zero only talk to A, one only talk to B, or you could design it so that you could cross connect them. It's a design choice. Are you expecting it to be higher performing to develop? Nope. In uh, in the this 
This approach, the PCIe and VME approach for hard drives, is a, it allows us to consolidate your storage architecture. So, and particularly for tiering, for offloading, uh, so for CPU and host memory offloading, um, which is nearly impossible to do with SAS, um, and for lower cost, particularly in NVMe or fabric chassis is what drives this. There's no performance. Hard drives um, do, you know, hard drive performance really doesn't, the, the, the amount of overhead that you get rid of by going to NVMe is, doesn't really register in a hard drive performance spectrum. And except in one small corner case is when you have a large uh, scale out of of um, storage to processor ratio, then the lower CPU utilization of NVMe might uh, let you scale out more, um, more cold storage per processor. But that might be a stretch also. We're really doing it for interoperability and uh, for, for the people who want to own their whole stack. So the no third party drivers. Okay, well, we get, so, and this is my, uh, the implementation for RAID for dual actuator, what does it mean? Because this is an interesting topic to me. Um, and uh, we kind of talked about reliability a little bit and, and I want to emphasize that both those actuators, uh, they are essentially in the same failure domain. You, like I said, you can, if you want to, you can might be able to divide them up, but that's probably not a level of detail that you can support in the real world. So we're looking at two different ways to approach this. Um, one is you, you take your two, you take your two LUNs, and you, for example, you stripe them locally, and then combine those striped uh, volumes into a RAID structure that suits your workload and level of resiliency that you need and performance. There is no advantage to mirroring these that I can think of. And the other approach is to take your, your brace, your, your, your set of dual actuator drives and generate two, two virtual, two RAID sets out of them. One out of the evens, one out of the odds. And in, in this case, the RAID scheme you use here, again, is something you would select based on what, what you normally use for levels of redundancy and, uh, and availability, performance. Thanks for listening. Um, I think this uh, dual actuators and, and this kind of work on parallelism in general, multiple readers and stuff, are good for hard drive industry. They allow us to do, to, it, it's, it's really a rare opportunity for a company like us and, and an industry like us, we're not the only people looking at this obviously, to take the technology that we've worked on a long time that we know a lot about and scale it up and, and for once, make a difference to the customer. Um, you know, hard drives cost competitive per terabyte, still extremely, but not per I/O, as, as everybody in this room already knows. Um, at the 14 terabyte point is where most, where a lot of our customers are starting to feel this pain. Where we're finally running out of IOPS. Um, doubling our performance. We have, a, we have a flash division. I have lots of people who work with SSDs. And when we, I started working on this project with them, I said, we're gonna double, because you really do. You really do double your random IOP performance. It's true. You really do double your sequential IOP performance within, you know, within, the, within the most normal workloads. There are, like I told you, diabolical workloads where you can take, where you can um, defeat the shared data path elements and cause some and cause some degradation, but we'll fix those. 
Thanks for showing. Thanks for listening. Thanks for all the questions. I appreciate your time.